Today I'm going to talk about viral infections of the oral cavity. This is Dental Basics and I'm Dr. Parvati Raghavan. This video is only about the herpes simplex virus type 1 infections, its symptoms in the oral cavity, prognosis, treatment and so on. We will learn what is a virus, different types of herpes affecting the oral cavity, clinical symptoms, Diagnosis of HSV type 1 and treatment plan. What is a virus? They are small parasites. And what are parasites? They are organisms that live inside other organisms of a different species and derive nutrition from them. Viruses are particles that contain DNA or RNA but not both of them together. These particles are covered by a protein coat. Some viruses are enveloped by molecules of protein and fat. The image shows two viruses, one with DNA and one with RNA, and this one has a capsid. The protein shell of a virus is called the capsid. What is so special or different about these viruses is that they can be stored like mineral specimens for years without changing, and during this period, there is no need for them to feed or excrete or even respire. What happens when these parasites come in contact with living tissue? This is the cell, nucleus, and this is the virus outside. The virus first sticks to the cell, then enters inside. Once inside the host cell, the protein coat breaks and the viral DNA or RNA is released inside the cytoplasm. This DNA then moves into the nucleus of the cell and manipulates the host nucleus to make copies of itself and also its protein coat. It then leaves the nucleus, breaks the host cell wall and many more viruses are released. Every different type of virus has its own distinct way of hacking into the nucleus of the host cell and it is a very interesting topic to read. But I am going to stop here and continue with our main topic. Here is a list of viral infections commonly affecting the oral cavity. There is herpes simplex type 1 and 2, varicella zoster or the chickenpox virus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalo, coxsackie also known as hand, foot and mouth disease virus, Kaposi sarcoma virus, rubiola or Mises virus. Out of these, rubiola is a RNA virus and the rest are DNA viruses. First five belong to the herpes group of viruses. The herpes simplex virus is of two types, herpes simplex 1 and herpes simplex 2. One occurs in the skin above the waist and two in the skin below the waist. Type 1 is further divided into primary, also known as herpetic gingivus stomatitis, and secondary is also called herpes labialis or cold sore. The word herpes originates from herpin, which means to creep or to move slowly. In the late 14th century, any spreading skin inflammation or skin eruption was called as herpes. In the primary infection, transmission occurs by close personal contact with the HSV type 1 virus in the sores and saliva of an infected person. All healthcare professionals are at risk, especially dentists, because they can also be transmitted from oral and skin surfaces that appear normal without any symptoms. So the best way of prevention is wearing gloves for protection, more so especially if you have a skin cut or abrasion in your hands. The secondary infection by HSV type 1 occurs only on reactivation of the primary infection and how this happens will be talked about in the slides that follow. Let us find out how the primary infection presents itself clinically. As the name gingivostomatitis suggests, there is inflammation of the gingiva and stoma. General symptoms include malaise for 10 to 14 days. Malaise is a feeling of uneasiness or discomfort. Patient could have fever. The cervical lymph nodes are tender. In gingivostomatitis, the gingiva shows generalized and acute marginal gingivitis along with gingival hyperplasia. 
In stoma, the entire oral mucosa shows inflammation with vesicles and shallow painful ulcers. Diagnosis of primary infection can be based on 1. The fact that oral symptoms appear 1-2 to two days later and 2. The typical feature of the gingiva with marginal gingivitis and hyperplasia. So the diagnosis can be done with just the history and clinical features. Additionally, microscopic examination can be done in a lab. A fresh vesicle can be opened, base of the lesion scraped, put on a slide and observed under a microscope. The slide shows 1. Ballooning degeneration of the epithelial cells and 2. Lipschitz bodies, which are collection of proteins of the viral capsid and represent site of viral multiplication. These two are both features of primary and secondary infection. Antibodies to primary infection appears in a week after exposure and reaches a peak in three weeks. So if we compare the antibody titer taken during the acute phase of the viral infection and that during the recovery phase, there is a fourfold or four times increase in the antibodies in the acute phase. This also helps in confirming the diagnosis of primary purpose simplex type 1 infection. In this slide, there are two new terms, vesicle and ballooning degeneration. Let us find out what these are. A vesicle is a circumscribed superficial elevation on the mucous membrane with intraepithelial collection of infectious fluid. Intraepithelial means within the layers of the epithelial cells. Some epithelial cells in the wall of the vesicle get washed off, swell up, the nuclei undergoes division and the cell may float in the vesicular fluid. This is called ballooning degeneration which can be seen under a microscope. Let us now know a little bit more about the oral ulcers. The reddening of the oral mucosa is followed by the formation of numerous vesicles. These vesicles rupture easily in the oral cavity due to the constant movement of the tongue, teeth, buccal mucosa during swallowing, speaking, chewing, etc. Rupture leads to painful shallow and clear ulcers which later develop a red inflammatory halo around. They coalesce into larger irregular lesions. These eventually heal without scar formation. Now, the question is, is there any specific age group which is more susceptible to the primary infection? In infants, it occurs after six months of age and therefore can be mistaken for teething. Highest incidence is among children between one to three years of age. It occurs in adults also and varies in severity. Rare complications are encephalitis, that is inflammation of the brain, and keratitis, that is inflammation of the cornea. Now let us look at the treatment plan for the primary infection. Generally, it is self-limiting. The ulcers heal spontaneously in 7 to 14 days. How does this happen? Studies show that these vesicles are a form of intercellular communication. They carry immune components which activate immune response of the host cell on sensing foreign DNA. This inhibits further replication and dissemination of the virus, thus controlling the infection. But symptoms like fever and pain from the ulcers have to be treated. Symptomatic treatment of primary infection is done using systemic analgesics like paracetamol, for reducing fever, for painful ulcers, topical analgesics like lidocaine containing gels and chlorhexidine mouthwashes are used at frequent intervals. Aim is to reduce pain and prevent secondary infection which occurs in 40% of the population. Very ill or immunocompromised patients are given systemic acyclovir 200 to 400 mg 5 times daily for 5 days. Apart from this, an increased intake of fluids and a soft, non-spicy diet is advised. Let us now move on to a secondary infection, also called herpes labialis or cold sore. It occurs in 40% of the population. 
A primary infection lies dormant in the trigeminal ganglion. Certain factors like immunosuppression, upper respiratory tract infection, fever, stress, ultraviolet light from exposure to sun, these can cause reactivation of the infection usually on the skin of the lip or nose, which is supplied by one of the branches of the trigeminal nerve. There is burning, itching, tingling, erythema and pain. These are the symptoms. Typical feature is the occurrence of vesicle and they break down into ulcers at the mucocutaneous junctions like the vermilion border of the lips. And here it is called as herpes labialis. Some people when they catch cold, they get these sores. So this secondary infection is also called as cold sore. Rarely, intraoral blisters are found and they are found in the bound down areas of the oral cavity like the attached gingiva and the heart palate. How does the virus reach the trigeminal ganglion? When the viruses are replicating in the epithelial cells, they enter the sensory nerve endings present around the basal layer and are transported along the axon to the nerve body present in the sensory ganglion. Here they lie dormant. Antibodies produced by the host cells reduce the primary infection but do not prevent recurrence. Treatment is topical acyclovir 5% on the lesion every 4 hourly for 5 days. In very ill or immunocompromised patients, systemic acyclovir 200 to 400 mg 5 times daily is given for 5 days. A diet for primary and secondary HSV type 1 is soft and non-spicy food and increased fluid intake. Lastly, a lesion common in both primary and secondary infection, the herpetic vitlo. It is a lesion on a finger or thumb with extremely painful abscess. It occurs in contact with the lesion in the mouth or saliva, common among dentists and also other healthcare providers. It is also seen in children with primary infection who have the habit of thumb sucking. Treatment is analgesic for pain in the finger, it is also very important to keep the area clean so that it can improve on its own. Thank you for watching and sharing. Remember to press on the like button below and subscribe.